right, thank you. Um, and welcome to this speech on uh, long duration energy storage utilizing hydrogen. My name is uh, Harald Ulvar, I'm, I'm a project manager at Technip FMC. And also I would like to thank you all for showing up just after lunch. I know that's a bit of a, a well, impressive to do. So thank you for all that. And also thank you to the organizer for putting this nicely together. So first, I want to draw your attention to a growing global challenge. How to store renewable energy. First of all, I think we all felt uh, the last couple of years how uh, intermittent the the power in the grid has become. First of all, with solar and wind, we know that when there's plenty of it, we get what we demand and what we require. But when there's too little, it's we need other means. And also, on the, this also piggyback bank to the infrastructure side of it, that we need to transfer this from other areas compared to where we used to do. So the old way of uh, the infrastructure might not be feasible for going forward. Then there's a higher demand of energy as we also uh, go forward. Uh, and also we're going to the more lucrative, let's say high end power, meaning electricity. So as we're transiting from fossil fuels, we believe that there, we need to store even more energy going forward than we have done in the past. Now, historically, energy storing is nothing new. It's been around for, for decades huge part of the energy mix. And for where I come from, uh, up in the north, uh, these big water magazines has been around for decades. Here down in the south of Europe, I believe you have these uh, natural gas caverns, uh, which also uh, done the similar thing in the terawatt scale. On the megawatt end of it, though, we've recently seen large battery farms being de developed to cope with this shorthand intermittency of uh, changes in the electrical grid. But we in Technip FMC, we believe there is a gap here in the value chain where compressed hydrogen storage subsea might be a good option. And I'll try to illustrate that further as we go into the presentation. So this, uh, this has been displayed and I believe many of you have seen it before, but nevertheless, uh, there's a lot of different technologies out there for storing uh, energy. But when you're looking upon high power and long duration, there's really, hydrogen stands out to be an attractive solution. So, but also I would like to emphasize this third bullet point on enabling flexibility. That's very key as well, because it, it increases flexibility of how you develop your site. By that you can detach the energy capacity and the energy stored. What does that mean? That means that compared to batteries where there's a link between megawatt and megawatt hours, and when you utilize hydrogen, you can actually detach that and you can design your power charge, your power storage, and your power discharge independently. Third, uh, also it's nice to know that you can also have, kind of have a side stream of utilizing the hydrogen you have stored to other means, should there be an interest in the project that you're looking into. So, now I want to draw your attention to a new technology that Technip FMC has under development. It's subsea storage of compressed hydrogen. Now, for those who are not familiar with our company, but we've around, been around for quite a number of years uh, in the oil and gas business, primarily having been focused on the subsea part of it. And we utilized the uh, seabed for years to build uh, oil and gas facilities around the globe. And now we see also that it could be a very lucrative opportunity for storage of hydrogen. And then we're talking tonnage storage, meaning megawatt or hundreds of megawatt hours in each module. But then, you, of course, you might ask, why subsea? Uh, I see somebody's nodding. Good enough. And those, these bullet points here, I think, kind of gives a bit of truthful thought around that, especially on the safety side of it. But down there on the seabed, it's stable environment. There's no direct sunlight, it's stable pressure, it's stable temperature. That's lucrative for storage. Secondly, it's also, there's no ignition gas around. There's no oxygen. So it's an oxygen or ignition gas free environment. And a bit bluntly said, uh, you can place it far from people. So a bit out of kind of out of worry. But that's actually true because you can place it so that 
there's the perceived risk it's it's uh, reduced then on the flexibility end of it it gives a lot of options for your onshore facility it minimizes the onshore area because you have your storage subsea but more importantly i would like to emphasize that it gives you flexibility on where you put it because you don't put uh, unneeded safety zones around the storage. I think you will bump into those kind of challenges as soon as you go into tonnage of storage uh, on shore that you will need safety distance around where you put it. And you can of course put this close to the, where the needs are, where the hydrogen is being produced or where the consumer is to really optimize your infrastructure around the whole uh, development. Last, of course, is scalable. We're shooting for Lego bricks as everybody else in this business. A big, bigger Lego bricks, though. Um, but the whole intent is to kind of offer, uh, you can add on storage as you move along, depending on how your development has evolved over time. So this technology is actually under development, and we're in the middle of uh, qualifications of the project. Uh, it is supported by Norwegian government, partly, and we are targeting to getting uh, it qualified by the end of next year. So, looking a bit different uh, into different market opportunities for what the subsea storage can really enable. And we see that it really could bring value in some, well, mentioned cases here in, in writing, but I'll talk more about it. It's a, it could be a key building block both in your current known uh, project, but it could also be an enabler for the project which has been a bit shelved because of constraints on where we're at. So for one, uh, hydrogen can be bunkered in this way. It can be uh, your secondary large-scale bunkering, for instance, for marine mobility. So you have your day operations on land while you have your secondary larger uh, subsea storage um, underway there. And then secondly, it could, of course, bring you a buffer capacity, the same as you have with plumbing at home. You can have an accumulator tank, so to speak, on the seabed, which then pretty much removes the intermittency between the producer and the user, so that you, can, you, you can link up several users along the way, which also then, which here displayed in the picture, you can actually create a hydrogen hub, so to speak, so you over time can link up and enable several developers and several, several projects and, and connecting them. And then a next opportunity, which we've also been working on for quite a number of years, is to use hydrogen as a, as a battery for delivering long-duration energy storage. I talked a lot about the subsea part of it and the substrate infrastructure part of it, but it also enables a lot of opportunities on the onshore part of it. The onshore subsystem consists of electrolyzers, compressor, we're shooting for 350 bar here, subsea storage, and fuel cells. So earlier I mentioned on the subsea part, what that gives of, of value, but there's also equally opportunities on the offshore side. On the, suns, on the safety end of it, really you remove a lot of the safety concern around the storage because you have that deployed subsea. Secondly, it's, it's compact. So you can really optimize your design according to your needs at your site. And you don't kind of take up more acreage on land than you necessarily need to. And you don't fall back to your, the safety zones, which I just mentioned earlier. And thirdly, scalable, of course. You can add on modules both on the power uh, production side and the regeneration side, depending on how your uh, facility grows over time. So uh, as one of my earlier speaks I listened to here, they talked about kind of proof of the pudding. So we've also gone beyond, I would say, from PowerPoints and engineering to actual engineering. And here's a demo project that we concluded at the tail end of last year, where we completed a hydrogen long duration energy storage demonstrated project, together with a list of partners, as you see underneath here, and also funded and partly funded by the Norwegian government. Now, the goal of this project was, was for us, at least, to, to design and to build and to operate a small-scale, off-grid, renewable power system, a hydrogen long-duration energy system. But of course, it's also demonstrated that we can deliver stable power. So we actually connected in the same control system, power control and process control. 
I think that's pretty novel. Has, don't, haven't seen too many prospects around on that. And on top of that, we also build a dynamic model uh, to really replicate what we saw on site physically to use that on the sim uh, software simulator, which we also have in-house. Now, this plant was installed right next to our offices in, in Kongsberg, Norway. So really put it through the test because we did extensive testing on this a year round, meaning we got the winterization part of it, we got the rain, we got the, all the weather condition you can imagine. And we also built a visitor center next to it, in addition to a remote operator room, because that was part of the goals of the project, to really prove this concept remote. We uh, went through a very comprehensive qualification program, and this uh, figure here to the right is actually just the display of one of the cases that we, we ran through the system. But all in all, we were a successful project. We, we did it all what we set out to do, and we delivered stable power from a renewable source. It was a truly innovative project together with an, an open innovation type of project. We don't, too many of those are coming around, but we were very happy to be part of this. And we also included a lot of emulators for different, uh, so you can run different use cases, which now we're looking forward to do going, going uh, into the future. So, that is, that is pretty much what I had. I see that we have some time left, but there is some closing, closing final takeaways. So, have in mind that the safety aspect, the compactness and the flexibility and the scalability. That's really the main drivers, both for the search sea part of this and also to the top side system. And then if you're interested in any further talk, we can have that after, or I have some time for some questions, should there be one or several. Nope. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day.